insect ID. If you ever have anything in your garden or if you see anything that you're interested in having identified, first I'd stop here at the County Extension Office. But if uh, Janie, Mitchell, Anthony can identify it, uh, that's when they bring it to us. And uh, we have uh, people all across the state to identify things. So this is, a, this is a really busy time for us. We also do social media. Uh, the Soil Plant Test Center has a Facebook page. Uh, why might you be interested in following that? Well, I put up three or four things yesterday that I was asked about yesterday. So it's highly topical. The things that you see on our Facebook page are things that we were just asked probably that day or the day before. So if you want to keep up with what's going on in the, as far as things that we're seeing disease-wise, insect-wise, follow us on Facebook at the Soil Plant Test Center. So, you know, what is straw bell gardening? Essentially, it's container gardening about the container. Um, have, have, has anybody in here tried straw bell gardening? Okay. And did you have success with it? I did. Good. What about you? I did. Yeah. Good. You know, it's interesting. You get online and you look and there's a lot of inf interesting information. There are video how-to videos. There's some good information. Some of it's kind of conflicting. Uh, there was... Uh, I saw a friend of mine post an article about strawberry gardening recently, and he had a lot of, you have to do this, it's, it's great, uh, you don't have to fertilize it, which I disagree with. But then later in the article, he said that he peed on his bales. Uh, so, you know, they, he was actually fertilizing his straw bales. Now, I do not recommend that kind of fertilization. Uh, I tend to use granular fertilizer right out of the bag or a, a water-soluble fertilizer that you can buy uh, like here from Rome. But uh, anyway, basically what are some of the advantages of straw bales? Uh, well, the height for one thing, you know, the older that I get, raised beds really <laughs> sound pretty nice. I like that. No digging or cultivation. Uh, I like that too. Uh, where I live in the county, the soil's just not the best and I haven't amended uh, my garden area very much over the years. So I was looking for another way to garden uh, fairly inexpensive, uh, especially if you knew somebody that you could buy uh, straw bales from. I tend to use wheat straw, I like that, because you have less um, wheat seed in there. Um, afterwards, the bales can be used for mulch or, or compost. You know, if you, if you plant a straw bale garden in the wrong place, and you're like, boy, there's not enough sun here, guess what? You can move it. You can move it to a sunnier location. And then the one reason that I'm really interested in it uh, because I work with diseases is uh, you can avoid certain um, soil-borne pathogens and insects. Now you're not going to have an insect-free garden as I learned last year. The ones that crawl and fly, they get their own strawberry gardens too. Uh, so again, one reason I'm interested in it, this is uh, from the Davidson County Master Gardener Demo Garden a couple of years ago. They were growing heirloom tomatoes. 
and they weren't looking very good. So I went and pulled the, this tomato up and I washed the roots off. And that's what the roots of the tomato look like. Now, is that normal? No, no that's not normal. They're all galled up because of root knot nematode. Uh, so heirloom tomatoes, great taste, a lot of them, but what they don't have is disease resistance to things like nematodes. So guess what? In a strawberry garden, you don't have to worry about nematodes. Grow your heirloom tomatoes, and you don't have to worry at all about things that are in the soil like uh, root knot nematode. So some considerations. Well, it's almost like any place you would grow roses. You want a sunny location, sunny exposure. You've got to have a water source nearby because you are going to be watering these bales because essentially they are containers. So you do need a water source. Uh, the height of the plants. Somebody was asking me at a, an earlier presentation about growing corn in straw bales, and I'm like, ooh, I'm not sure that I would do that. But uh, you probably would have to stake the bales or stake or some kind of trellis system for the corn to do that because they might blow over. Uh, row width. Um, you can put a lot of these close together in a sunny location. Uh, they can be as tight or as loose as you want. So that's not a bad thing. So uh, this is the location I used last year and I'm using it again this year. You know, one thing that you, when you read about straw bale gardening, uh, a lot of people, they say you have to do this, you have to do that. Basically, the only have to's in my book, you've got to have straw bales, you've got to have a water source, you've got to have a sunny location, and yes, you are going to fertilize these bales. There's even some people that will argue about how to orient the bales. Uh, basically, I already did with the straps around the outside because as these things decay, they're going to want to fall apart. So if you have the straps around the outside, that keeps everything together. And as you go through a season, you'll understand the wisdom of that because the bell will shrink uh, and the straps still help hold it together. So that's the way I do mine. Uh, well, to start off, actually I'm still in the conditioning period. I put my bells out a little bit before Easter. Uh, I was gone all last week, uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to plant my garden before knowing that I was going to be gone for eight days, so I'm going to plant this week. So my bales have actually been conditioning for about six weeks now. So what you want to do is you want to keep the bales wet for about three days. And again, it doesn't have to be exact, but basically when you buy your bales, they're going to be dry, so you want to wet them as part of the conditioning. And then you want to sprinkle. Uh, what about fertilizer? If you look this up, people might recommend urea or ammonium nitrate. Basically a high nitrogen fertilizer. Why? There's really not much nitrogen in that bell. And you want to start that conditioning or breaking down process to soften the bell so you can even plant into it. You're going to continue to keep the bells wet for 7 to 10 days. Actually longer is probably better. Um, and then you're going to check and make sure that, it, that you haven't created a mini compost pile that would actually kill the roots of plants when you plant them. So, um, and there's actually a good way to, to check that. So let's look. So basically, what I, you know, what I've done the last two years, put the bales out. I will get my fertilizer, I'll top dress the top of the bales, and then I'll start watering. And if we don't have rain and the bales not wet, I'm probably going to get the hose and wet the bales every day, uh, at least until I plant. Plenty of chairs on the front row. We've got chairs for. Come on, come on, sit down. Find a chair. Okay, what else? So basically, after you put fertilizer to start the conditioning process, you know, you've kept the bells wet for a few days, you put the fertilizer on, and then you start watering. And basically, keeping the, well, the bells wet to soften them up because they are really tight. So you want to keep them wet and uh, you know basically probably if you're going to do this next year i would probably put the bells out maybe first of march just let rain hit them and start softening them up uh, you probably can't do it for too long uh, so what can you grow well basically anything that you can grow in a sunny location whether it's vegetables herbs flowers uh, last year what did i grow uh, i grew um, tomatoes bell peppers basically i was just kind of trying it out this year I'm going to have squash, cucumbers, herbs. Uh, I'm probably going to get some white petunias and have white petunias cascading off of some of the bells. Uh, just to try to experiment with different things. So I'm going to try a lot of different things this year. 
So you can grow just about anything in a strong bell garden. Uh, so, you know, a big question is wheat straw or hay bales? I like wheat straw. Why? Um, because you're going to have less wheat seed. You will have some wheat seed in the bales that will germinate, but guess what? Wheat doesn't like to grow in the summer. When, it, when does wheat grow around here? Fall, winter, spring. This time of year, the fields start turning dry. Why is that? It's all heat related, so it doesn't do well. If you have somebody that bells hay and you bought hay from them, you probably would have all kinds of things germinating once you wet those bells. So once the seed gets wet. Um, also on hay bells, if the person has used a herbicide in their pasture to control broadleaf weeds, that can be an issue also. On the wheat straw, I haven't had that issue. Everything grew just fine last year. So I basically, you know, straw bells made from grains, wheat, oats, rye, alfalfa. Well, alfalfa's not a grain, but <coughs> the wheat straw is really easy to find around here. Uh, what about planting methods? Well, again, there's no hard and fast rule. You can create little pockets <coughs> on top of the bells to plant into, or you can just uh, you can flat use a flat top, put a growing medium on top of the bell, and plant into it. That's what I did last year. Didn't really know what I was doing. What I found out was that after a while, basically, uh, basically all of the potting mix they put on top of the bells, I was washing off the rest of the summer. So that didn't work too well. This year I'm going to go with the pocket method where I'm going to create little holes on top. I'll use some potting mix uh, just to create a little container on top of the bell. Wet that. Um, so potting mix or compost is fine. And then like I said, I, put, I position the bells with the twine or bands on the side just to hold the bell together. So this is what I did last year. I got a positive <coughs> tool, created a flat top, and planted into that. And it worked pretty well. Um, I did wash a lot of that off this season, but by that time, all my plants had rooted well into the bell. It really didn't matter. <coughs> uh, you'll notice here that some of the wheat plants are starting to germinate. <coughs> Not a big deal. Uh, I did have some hand shears that I went out a couple times and just cut them back. Uh, but really not a problem. So let's look at a planting guide. How many plants can you plant into a straw bale? Well, it depends on whether it's a, it's a large plant. Is it a dwarf plant? Is it a patio tomato? You could probably plant. Last year I planted uh, uh, like for uh, determined size and indeterminate tomatoes. I like celebrity. I planted celebrity because of good disease resistance. Uh, I planted two per bale. But then I had a little patio tomato for cherry tomatoes. I planted three per bale. So it basically has to do with the size. This year I'm going to plant squash and cucumbers. Uh, I'll probably have two yellow squash per bale. And on cucumbers, I'll probably do, I don't know, two or three. But uh, there are, if you look online, there are any number of recommendations. Uh, but basically, you don't want to get it too crowded. Uh, give the plants room to grow. Uh, my father actually was a horticulturist and did research on tomatoes for over 40 years. Celebrity was always one of his favorites. Every time I asked him, hey, what would you plant this year? He always said celebrity. So it's a nice size tomato, good disease resistance. Uh, so that's one that they planted. For bell peppers, I planted three pepper plants per bell. Again, there's some leeway in here. I probably could have gotten away with planting four. Or you can plant as few as two, it just depends on what you want to do. Uh, by June 30th, tomatoes were looking really good. They were growing well. I had fertilizers. Basically, what kind of fertilizer? I think the most difficult thing with a straw bale garden, and I've asked for some help from this by our lab director, Debbie Jones, who's a soil scientist. I'm like, you know, I basically was just guessing my way through fertilization. Uh, because I didn't really know how much to apply, but basically I was using like a, uh, you can use an organic fertilizer, I chose not to. I used like a triple tin and I would top dress the bells with that once a month. And then once a week I would come and as I watered, I'd water the bells, get them wet. Then I'd come back afterwards and mix up like a liquid fertilizer like miracle Grow, their other brand, uh, and just pour that around each plant. Uh, and they, as you can see, they grew really well. The tomatoes did well in the, in the straw bells. Peppers did well. 
that's June 30th. Lots of fruit size is nice. Lots of nice clusters. Do you have a question? Um, the T post are those to hold the bales? Okay, the, no, the T posts are not to hold the bale. That is actually to hold the tomatoes. So I did. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did the Florida weave system. Basically, I put posts in between the bales where I had tomatoes. And I tie off the string here, and I weave through to the other end, tie it off, then come on the opposite side and weave in. So I've got string on both sides of these tomatoes holding them up. So basically, it's the Florida weave system, you can look that up online too. Really simple, but I knew that I would have to do something if I wanted to keep the tomatoes upright, otherwise they would just fall in and grown, grown down, which I guess that would have been okay too, but I chose not. I chose to keep them upright. So the post. Now the bells stay upright just fine. If you support the plants, the bells aren't going anywhere. So good clusters coming on there. And uh, really nice fruit. Um, they were ripening up here. And by you know, July 15th, we had lots of tomatoes. And so actually, you know what I did last year? Basically, other than water and fertilizer, I did nothing else. That's all I did. Uh, because I just wanted to see what would happen, what the disease pressure was like. And what I found out was that, yeah, I did have some foliar diseases, and actually if I had controlled them, I probably would have extended production a lot longer into the season. So I am going to try to control those this year. I am going to use an organic product to control leaf spot diseases. I'm going to use a copper soap. If you go and look at copper fungicides, there's one called copper octanoate. Uh, that's the active ingredient. There are many different brands, uh, but I'm going to use that this year to control uh, the leaf spot diseases, and I'll show you why. So considerations, watering. Uh, basically, by the time the tomatoes were good size, I was probably watering every day I'd get home from work and check. If we had rain, I didn't water. If we hadn't had rain, I probably would water. But basically, last year I only had seven bales. It took me about five to ten minutes to water each day when I got home from work. So once a month fertilization, once a month I would top dress with like a triple 10, triple 13. And then every week I would mix up a liquid tea, like miracle Grow or something similar. Mix that up and water, uh, water that in after I had watered. Weed control, really not an issue. I didn't really have any weeding to do other than occasionally, I think two or three times in the season I got my shears and cut back the wheat plants that had germinated. Uh, insect control. I didn't do any insect or disease control. I did have some insect problems later on in the season. So weed control. Basically what I found with weed straw, yeah, you wet the bell, guess what? The weed seed are going to germinate. <coughs> but it doesn't grow well in the summer. It's just not much of an issue. I did have insects. I had stink bugs on the tomatoes by late summer. And I even had a southern army worm uh, find its way uh, to my tomatoes. And I just picked it off. The, the stink bugs are really didn't do anything for, although this year you might try some neem oil or something like that to control those. I'm going to try something because they really were pretty bad by, say, by the 1st of August, the stink bugs were pretty bad. And if you know what stink, I mean, they really don't affect the, the edibility of the tomatoes. You do see little white bumps all over where they fed, where, they, where it kind of calcifies under the skin. Um, but I'm, I'll, try to, I'll try to annoy those. Okay, so guess what else you're going to have on a straw bell garden? You're going to have mushrooms, you're going to have slime molds. Uh, I, I actually study fungi, so I thought it was pretty neat. Uh, uh, this is one, uh, and this is really common, this little gray mushroom. Now, I've already had them up in the bells this year. Uh, it's a comprinopsis mushroom. It's not edible, so don't eat it. Uh, but, you know, what is it doing there? Well, basically, anytime you wet organic matter, guess what? You're going to have fungi growing on it. Uh, now, somebody, I think I put up I put up a photo of this on our Facebook page last year. And somebody goes, oh, well, great, because you got mycorrhizal fungi. Well, probably not. Uh, this particular mushroom is probably not a benefit to the plants that I planted, but it's not really a detriment either. So I didn't really worry about it. What about slime molds? I, mean, I had slime molds, too, and that was really kind of unexpected. But I did have slime molds several times during the summer. Uh, one night I stayed up all night photographing slime molds on my bells. I probably wouldn't do that, but I did. Uh, this slime mold is actually called the dog vomit slime mold. Uh, 
it's one of the more it's one of the more memorable slime models. But again, yeah, again, what is it doing there? It is not a pathogen. It's not affecting the plants. Uh, actually, now this is you know basically we think uh, plant cells uh, and cells in general as being really tiny. But actually, earlier in the night when this whole mass was gelatinous, it was essentially one cell. How about that? So somebody asked you, can you see a can you see a cell? Well, yeah, actually you can. Because what happens with a slime mold is you've got spores all in this, it was probably in the potting mix that I was using. But when they germinate, they all come together and fuse into one gelatinous cell. How about that? <laughs> Lots of different nuclei, but one cell. And then by the end of the night, guess what? They start cleaving into individual cells again. So that this one's starting to mature a little bit. Actually, it will be a kind of a dusty brown by the end of the day where it will disperse again. But no, no problems. Yeah. What about plant diseases? Um, I did have some plant diseases as you can see by uh, late July I was having some gray leaf spot. So the leaf spots that you see on tomatoes you have early blight. Uh, this happens to be gray leaf spot and it was causing some defoliation and actually if so last year like I said not controlling anything just let it go and see what happened. And actually, if I had controlled this, I probably would have had production much later into the season. But you have gray, you have lesions on the leaves that have gray centers. It's gray leaf spot. And it's, it can be pretty damaging. Um, but it didn't really affect the fruit. The fruit still matured. Uh, when you do knock the leaves off of tomatoes, guess what? You can have a little sun skull. Uh, that happens. But basically, they still produced. Uh, even into September, I was still harvesting tomatoes on these plants. So for more information, Volunteer Gardener, if you go to Google and type in Straw Bell Gardening, Volunteer Gardener, they have a segment on uh, Straw Bell Gardening. Uh, there are lots of videos on YouTube and several university publications. But there really aren't that many fast and hard rules that you have to abide by. You can kind of set it up and uh, do it the way that you want to. Uh, Jamie said that she was going to put this presentation on the Rutherford County uh, Extension website. If you want to go to the Soil Plant and Pest Center website online, um, you can go to Publications, click on that, and Presentations will be below that, click on that. And I've got Straw Bell Garden and a bunch of other presentations that Dr. Hell, our entomologist, and I have put up uh, for this, this uh, past winter meetings. So, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that. Be sure to follow us on Facebook if you want to keep up with what's going on in the garden world. And that's basically it. That is, that is Strawbell Gardening.